This morning, once again, we're going to be continuing in the Gospel according to Luke. We're looking at the last few verses of Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, 31 to 35. Luke 13, 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. They said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons, perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem! Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until the day you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Please be seated. May the Lord add his blessing to his holy, inerrant, and inspired word. Let's pray again together. Almighty God, we praise you for your word. We praise you that in your providential plan, this is the word that you would have us consider this morning. Lord, in this passage, we, we see your will. We see that your will was for Christ to come and to suffer and to die. And that nothing could thwart your will, your plan of redemption for your people. But Lord, at the same time, we see people rebelling against your will. Not that they could ever rebel against your decreed will, but they rebel against your moral will. Lord, as they reject the Savior, as they kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help us not to be among that number, but among the number who have turned from their sins and put faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would work in the power of your Spirit this morning, that all within the hearing of my voice would respond to the work of your Holy Spirit with repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. For the glory of his name and for the advance of his kingdom. Amen. Jesus taught us to pray to our Father in heaven saying, Your will be done. And praying for God's will to be done means that you are asking that God would help you to obey his moral will and to trust his decretive will. God's moral will is summed up in his moral law. God's decretive will refers to his decrees, to his sovereign rule. So when you pray for God's will to be done, you're asking him to give you active obedience to his commandments. You're praying for passive obedience to submit to his sovereign plan. The scriptures teach God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Now, with our fallen and our finite minds, we cannot understand how these two things, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, fit together. Yet they do. Scripture teaches both, and so we embrace and believe both. We've already seen this repeatedly throughout our studies of Luke's Gospel account, and we're going to see it again this morning. We've seen that many in Israel are disobeying God's moral will. That Jesus has been calling the people to repentance, but that many have and many will turn away from him. And we've also seen God's decretive will in directing Jesus' mission, especially as Jesus began his journey directly towards Jerusalem in, in Luke 9.51. But we know that, that Jesus' mission was towards Jerusalem even from the moment of his incarnation, the moment of his birth. Jesus was, from his conception, he was headed towards Jerusalem. God is leading Jesus toward Jerusalem. 
Remember that Luke gave us a signpost that pointed towards Jerusalem at the beginning of our last passage in Luke 13, 22. Jerusalem is the destination for Jesus' ministry. It is also Jesus' destination for his death. The people of Jerusalem will reject Jesus and hand him over to be crucified. This is against God's moral will, but it aligns with his decretive will. This was God's will from eternity past. As the Father and the Son made a covenant, the covenant of redemption, to save God's people, that the Son would take on human flesh and come and fulfill all of the covenant obligations. And so secure salvation for all the elect. Again, this is God's decretive will. But Jesus' death was directly as a result of Israel's immoral will. And as a result of the people's immoral will, Jerusalem, we will see, is doomed to destruction. So there are several competing wills in this passage. In verse 31, we see that Herod wants to kill Jesus. In verse 34, we see that Jesus, using the same Greek verb, that Luke says Jesus wants to gather Jerusalem's children. And then in verse 35, we see that Jerusalem, again, using the same Greek verb, the people of Jerusalem were not willing. And all of this is against the backdrop of God's will. So this morning we we have four main points. In verse 31, we see Herod's will. In verses 32 and 33, we see God's will. In verse 34a, we see Jesus' will. And then in verses 35, 40b and 35, we see that Jerusalem won't. So Herod's will, God's will, Jesus' will, and Jerusalem won't. So first of all, Herod's will in verse 31. With the beginning of verse 31, Luke tells us that at that very hour, some Pharisees came to Jesus. The words at at that very hour link what's happening here with what Jesus has just taught in the preceding passage. As Jesus journeys towards Jerusalem, he has been warning the people to turn from their sin. He has been clearly warning the people of what will happen to those who reject him. In this passage, we'll see Jesus lamenting their rejection. As we saw last week, many Jews will miss the wedding banquet, but many Gentiles will be there. The people have had the opportunity to repent, but the narrow door of salvation is closing. The barren fig tree is about to be chopped down. This is all according to God's decretive will and to their immoral will. And so some Pharisees come to Jesus to warn him to leave the area because Herod is looking to kill him. Herod's will is to kill Jesus. So Herod, remember, is Herod Antipas, the grandson of the so-called Herod the Great, the puppet king set up by the Romans to rule a quarter of Israel. And Herod Antipas' grandfather was about as far away from great as you could possibly get. He was the one who, not long after Jesus' birth, set out to kill the Messiah and so killed all of the baby boys in Bethlehem under the age of two. Herod Antipas was following in his grandfather's wicked footsteps. Remember, it was Herod Antipas who had married his brother Philip's wife. And back in Luke 3, 19 and 20, remember, John the Baptist had rebuked Herod for doing this. And for all of the the wickedness that that Herod was engaged in. And so Herod had had John locked up in prison. And then Luke 9, 9, we saw that Herod Antipas had had John the Baptist beheaded. Mark 16, uh, 14 to 29 provides the full story. So so Herod's grandfather had, had tried to kill Jesus. Herod had killed John the Baptist. And now Herod wants to kill Jesus. Herod saw Jesus as a threat. Yes, Jesus was a threat to Herod, but not as Herod assumed 
a threat to his rule because Jesus did not come to take down Herod's rule. In his first incarnation, Jesus did not come to fulfill a kingdom on earth. Yes, Jesus will fulfill his kingdom as return in the new heavens and the new earth, but, but for Herod, even now, Jesus' presence means judgment. It means that judgment is coming. And so if John the Baptist preaching exposed Herod's sin, how much more did Jesus' preaching and ministry? Herod was able to silence John the Baptist. Now he wants to silence Jesus. Herod wants to remove Jesus as a threat. So again, it is Herod's will to kill Jesus. And the Pharisees come to Jesus to warn him of Herod's will. They, they tell him to get out of here, to get out of this region. This strikes an ominous chord because both Herod and the Pharisees are going to figure prominently in Jerusalem at the trial of Jesus. But these Pharisees come to warn Jesus, and they have a will here too. But what is the Pharisees' will? What, what is their motivation? Now Luke does say here, some Pharisees. So, so maybe it, it's possible that, that these particular Pharisees were not actually against Jesus and his ministry. But I really don't think this, this seems likely because throughout Luke's gospel account, the, the Pharisees are presented in a, a wholly negative light as being in opposition to Jesus and his ministry. Well, maybe they, maybe they didn't like Jesus, but maybe they disliked Herod even more. Ironically, seeing Jesus as the lesser of two evils. Maybe they, they saw this as, as an expediency, as a, as a way to, to get Jesus out of the way without having him killed. But this also doesn't seem likely because, because they've been plotting to kill Jesus since all the way back in Luke chapter 6 when he healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. So we, we can't really know what the Pharisees' will was here with any certainty. But even if the, it was their will to protect Jesus, as doubtful as that is, like Herod's will to kill Jesus, their will will be thwarted because God has a different will. Jesus is going to leave. He is going to leave the region, but not because he's running from Herod. Jesus is going to leave the region because he has to accomplish God's will. So then, God's will, verse 32. Jesus replies to these Pharisees, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today, and the third day I will finish my course. So what does Jesus mean here when he refers to Herod as a fox? Now, in our culture, when we think of someone being called a fox, we think of someone being sly, as, as sly as a fox. Someone who's a fox is, is cunning. But we have to be careful not to overlay our own cultural presuppositions, our own cultural understandings on God's word. Because fox has a different connotation in the Bible. Now, it's true that in some Jewish literature, a fox is presented as sly, but, but in the Bible, a fox is described differently. The Bible describes a fox as a destroyer. As a destroyer. Foxes, or, or jackals, as it's sometimes translated, are, are among the ruins in Ezekiel uh, 13.4 and Lamentations 5.18. And so a fox can be presented as one who destroys. A fox is also in the scriptures used as, as something of, of, that is, is weak and something that is of, of little significance. You can see this in Nehemiah 4.3 as, as Tobiah mocks the builders of the wall in Jerusalem saying if a fox were to climb on the wall, it would break the wall down. So which is it? Is, is Herod a destroyer? Or is Herod insignificant? Well, both do fit the context. In the wider context, Herod is a destroyer. He has murdered John the Baptist. He's murdered one who is greatest among those born of women, Luke 7, 28. And he wants to murder Jesus, so he, he wants to destroy. And he will, we know from later on in Luke's Gospel, that he will conspire with the people of Jerusalem and with the Pontius Pilate, the Romans, to kill Jesus. We see that as well in Acts 4, 28. However, Herod is also insignificant. 
Acts 4, 25 and 26 teach this principle. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot notice, in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. This is a quote from Psalm 2, 1 and 2. It was read for us earlier. The, the psalm goes on to say in verse 4 that he who sits in the heavens laughs and holds them in derision. So both are true. Both are true. And I don't know which is particularly in mind here, but both are actually true. Herod is a destroyer, but he is an insignificant destroyer. He's an impotent destroyer. He's unable to do what he wants to do. Jesus is at no risk from Herod. Jesus is going to walk away from Herod. Jesus here is holding Herod in derision. Now, it's it's rare to see Jesus in the Gospels holding anyone with such scorn. But we see this as well in Luke chapter 20, uh, 23, verses 6 to 11, at his trial, where, where Jesus will not even stoop to say a word to Herod. He holds him in utter derision. As theologian John Dar explains, Harold is a varmint in the Lord's field, a murderer of God's agents, a would-be disrupt- disruptor of the divine economy. Herod's will is to kill Jesus, but his will, at least for now, is rendered ineffectual in light of God's decree of will. Herod wants to kill Jesus, but Herod's not going to get what he wants. Jesus will leave, but again, not because of the Pharisees' warning. Jesus will move on, again, not because he's running from Herod. He's going to leave because he is on a mission, and he knows that his mission leads to Jerusalem. So Jesus tells these Pharisaical messengers to go back to Herod, telling them point blank, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jesus is going to keep on doing what he's always been doing, no matter what Herod wants to do. Jesus will continue his ministry. Nothing can stop Jesus in his ministry. Now this reference here of today and tomorrow and the the day after speaks of a, of a quick progression of events, that these, these events are hurtling along, that they're, they're coming quickly. This is a, a, at the end of a, a brief but God-determined period. Jesus is going to arrive in Jerusalem and continue his ministry through his death. As you know, his ministry will continue through his death, beyond his death. As he's resurrected and as his ministry continues on through the disciples and through the church, through you, all the way until the end at his appointed return. And the end is hurtling on towards his return as well. Notice here that Jesus says explicitly that he must go on his way. It is God, not Herod, who will determine the end of Jesus' time on earth. Again, Herod wants to kill Jesus, but he won't get what he wants because God wants something else. God's will will be done. Jesus will accomplish his goal. The road inevitably leads to Jerusalem. God's will for the life and the ministry of Jesus is in Jerusalem. God's will for the death of Jesus is in Jerusalem. And at the end of verse 33, Jesus says that it it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Again, this is God's decree. Jesus is the prophet to whom all other, other previous prophets pointed. In his fulfillment of his office as prophet, he must perish like so many others before him, and he must perish in Jerusalem, like so many other prophets before him. We see that we saw this already in, in Luke 4.24 and, and 11.50-53, that, that the people rejected, the people killed God's messengers who were sent to them with God's word. Jesus is saying that his death, as they reject him, the word of God, this must take place in Jerusalem. 
The nation has repeatedly rejected those who have come to them with God's word, who spoke the word of God to them, and now the nation is going to reject the word of God incarnate. The nation will reject the Son of God, and this must take place in Jerusalem. It must be the place because this is God's decree of will. So Jesus is not going to back down, even in the face of, of impending death, because he knows his mission. This is ultimately why he came. This was his divine plan it, it, between the, the Father and the Son, and it made eternity pass. This is God's sovereign plan of redemption being played out. Now, why Jerusalem? Why specifically did this have to happen in Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem is the political and the cultural and the spiritual capital of Israel. That what happened in Jerusalem was was central and really representative of what took place in the whole of the nation. Luke refers to Jerusalem 90 times. There's only 49 other references to Jerusalem in the rest of the, of the New Testament. Jerusalem is, is going to be the location of the climax of Jesus' acceptance in his first incarnation at the triumphal entry. And it's going to be the climax of his rejection at at the point of his crucifixion just one week later. Jerusalem. Many cities have a a bad reputation because of of what has taken place there. Hiroshima will always be remembered as the place where 140,000 died at the dropping of the atomic bomb. Pompeii will always be remembered as a place where 2,000 died at the at the eruption of Mount Vesuvius as molten rock and ash and and poisonous gas rained down and killed 2,000 people. Beijing will always be remembered, at least outside of China, for the Tiananmen Square Massacre, where 10,000 were killed by the so-called Chinese People's Liberation Party. But none of these cities have the infamous reputation of Jerusalem for its rejection and its crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, it is Jesus' will to have mercy on Jerusalem. So Jesus' will in verse 34a. Also, like the prophets before him, Jesus laments for the rejection of the people of God and his word. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem! the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings? Matthew 23, 37 is almost identical, but seems to have been taught on another occasion, closer to Jesus' crucifixion. As a repetition, Jerusalem, Jerusalem shows us Jesus is grieving deeply over the rejection of of the people of the city. Now we're going to see Jesus again lamenting over Jerusalem as he approaches the city, right at the the end of this section, as he is on the outskirts of Jerusalem, just before the triumphal entry in in Luke 19, 41-44. Let's just turn there for a moment. A couple of chapters over. Luke 19, 41-44, one of the, only a, a few times in the scriptures we see Jesus weeping. As he drew near, Verse 41, and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. So Jesus is there on the outskirts of Jerusalem. He is there on a a mission of mercy to provide salvation. If only they will repent from their sins and put their faith in him. But because they reject Jesus, he's, he goes on to say in, in, in 43, in the first part of 44, that, that the, the city is going to be destroyed, that it is going to be, there's going to be a, 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 an army that's going to attack against it, that they're going to be surrounded, it's going to be destroyed. Not the, the stones are going to be pulled down. Why? Because the end of verse 44, you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is weeping for the city that represents the nation, his own people. Did not recognize that they had the opportunity for salvation. 
So here Jesus laments as he reflects on the people of Jerusalem who had, had killed the prophets and those who had sent by the word of God. They were stoned to death. This is the method of capital punishment, among other things, for blasphemers. They would kill Jesus. They would call Jesus a blasphemer. But not through stoning. The people of Jerusalem would, would hand him over to the Romans for crucifixion so that, that the Romans would do their dirty work. But nevertheless, Jesus wants, Jesus wills to gather the people, to shield them, and to look after them. Now we know that Jesus is God. He is God the Son. He is God incarnate. Truly God and truly man. So how can it be that if, if Jesus wills something, that it doesn't happen? We're talking here about a third form of of God's will. We've spoken about God's decretive will and God's moral will. This is another aspect of God's will. God's characteristic will. God's will according to his attributes. God's way of acting according to his holy nature. So we know that, that God is righteous and just. That God must punish sin. Yet God is also loving and merciful and gracious and eager to extend forgiveness to those who repent and put their faith in Him. So this this idea of of God's characteristic will, R.C. Sproul refers to this as God's basic will, or God's inclination. John MacArthur calls this God's compassionate will, that Jesus came to provide a way of salvation, that this is His mission, that Jesus came to walk in obedience to God, and He came to to live the righteous life that no one has ever lived besides him. But he also came to be the sin bearer, to bear God's wrath instead of his people, to die the death that we all deserve to die. Jesus' atoning sacrifice was sufficient. There, there was Jesus' blood was enough for all people to be saved, but it was efficient for the elect that Jesus died to make it, not just to make it possible, but to actually accomplish salvation for his people. Jesus doesn't just get you part of the way and then your will gets you the rest of the way. It's all Jesus. Salvation is monergistic by God and God alone. Jesus came to call people to himself in repentance and faith. We've been seeing this throughout Luke, and and most recently he's taught again and again since the beginning of of chapter 12. This, This call is real. It is a sincere offer of the gospel. However, as we'll see, the call of repentance and faith is only effectual in the elect. It's only able to save those who are where the call is, is accompanied by the work of regeneration through the power of the Holy Spirit. But even for those who are not elect, Jesus desires to extend mercy. He desires to extend mercy to the people of Jerusalem, to his nation. And we know that God the Son has the same will as that of the Father and as that of the Holy Spirit. God's will is identical in each of the members of the Trinity because there's only one God. We're talking here about God's kindness. Puritan Thomas Watson says, let us look into God's revealed will and there we shall find enough to cherish hope and to encourage us to go to God for pardon for our sins. He said in his word that he is rich in mercy and he does not delight in the destruction of a sinner. So under this head, Watson says that that we should look to the the tender mercies of God and to his precious promises. God is not vindictive even against those who hate him, even against those who will crucify him. It is truly God's will to be merciful even to the wicked. Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, declares the the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? 
unrepentant sinner. The call is going forth again. This is a sincere offer of the gospel for you. For you to repent and turn to Jesus in faith. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He's offering to you life in Jesus Christ. But the house of Israel will not. They will not turn back from evil ways. They, they have a will to die. And so Jerusalem won't. Verses 34b and 35. As Jesus says at the end of verse 34, You were not willing. But you were not willing. Jesus was willing to save them, but they were unwilling to be saved. As we've been discussing, the the people who who respond to Jesus, they were going to respond in the same way as their forebears responded to the prophets who had come before. God is not the author of sin. But they did according to their immoral will. And this was in line with God's decretive will. As Peter proclaims in Acts 2, 22 and 23, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So, so Peter is saying here that it was God's decree of will that Jesus would come and be handed over. But it is, it is God, it is the immoral will of these men to hand Jesus over to be killed. It wasn't just their will in that moment to kill Jesus. It was that will, it was that, that, their will in that moment not to be saved. So then how does that line up with what we just heard about Jesus' will to save them? A lot of people stumble over these truths. In my conversations with Arminian brothers about God's sovereignty, they almost invariably take the the conversation to the concept of man's free will. They'll they'll use verses like verse end of verse thirty four as a proof text in order to attempt to prove that the, the the free will of man supersedes the sovereignty of God. They believe that that human beings are free. That they are free and that they are able to choose God. However, free will, as they understand it, is not a biblical concept. If you look through your scriptures for the the words free will, the only place you'll actually find is in the context of a free will offering. Free will, as they understand it, is not biblically accurate. Man cannot and man will not choose to obey God's will because man's will is bound in sin. Man is not morally free. Yes, people are free in a sense, but they're only free to act according to their nature. Because all human beings have a fallen nature, they also have a fallen will. And they will always make immoral choices. Immoral according to the holy standard of God's moral will. As Romans 6 explains, unbelievers are slaves of sin. So people will always choose sin unless God does a work of regeneration in their heart. However, God chooses to save some according to his purpose of election, according to his decretive will, according to his sovereign plan. So read in John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of men, cho- rather to become children of God. Now hear this, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Similarly, John six forty four. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In Romans 9, 15 and 16, God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So those who are saved are saved because of the primacy of God's will. Not because of their alleged free will, but because God has given them a new heart. Because 
God, the power of the Holy Spirit has, has granted them repentance and faith and, and, and changed their wills. So that they are now free to choose God in a way that they were never free before. But Arminians do not understand how, how God's sovereignty and man's responsibility fit together. Someone asked Spurgeon, how do you reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility? He said, I don't. You don't have to reconcile friends. So do you see what Spurgeon is saying there? He's saying that God is sovereign and man is responsible. God's will will stand. Human beings are responsible for their sinful choices, for their willfully sinful choices. This is a mystery. This is an apparent paradox. But again, Scripture teaches both, and so we embrace both. So God here is making the offer of salvation. This is actually mercy that's being extended to these people yet again. But some people would say, well, maybe I'm not elect. I, I won't choose God because I'm not elect. Well, that's really just compounding sin. It, it's making God an excuse for not repenting. If you want to die and be eternally separated from God, you have no one to blame but yourself. John 5.40 you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Proverbs 124, I have called and you refuse to listen and stretch out my hand and no one has heeded. Romans 10.21, but if Israel says all day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Acts 7.51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the, of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So like those of the city who had killed the prophets who came before, the people of Jerusalem will reject Jesus and reject the offer of salvation that he brings. They reject deliverance, choosing instead to deliver Jesus over to death. They have forsaken God, and God will forsake them. See this pattern throughout the Old Testament prophets. Repent and turn to God, and if you for, but if you forsake God, God will forsake you. See this in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, throughout the Old Testament. Jeremiah 12, 7. I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. So like the prophets of old, Jesus now pronounces woe on the city. Verse 35, Behold, your house is forsaken. Luke 21, 24, says they, will, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The barren fig tree of Luke 13, 6-9 is going to be cut down. So Jesus finishes by saying, I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a quote from Psalm 118. Verses 26 and 27 read, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He's made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords. And, and this here in Psalm 118 speaks of the, the priest pronouncing blessing on those who came to worship in the temple. Pilgrims who were probably led in the king's procession. Jesus is saying that until Jerusalem and Israel acknowledges Jesus as blessed by God, they'll be judged. This is echoed at the triumphal entry at the end of the section, Luke 19, 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But I don't believe that the triumphal entry is, is in view of this first because Matthew, when he quotes Jesus as saying this, these words are repeated after the triumphal entry in Matthew 23, 39. This passage could refer to the return of Christ when, when Jews will look on Jesus whom they have pierced. Re Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes on the, of the earth will wail on account of him. 
even so, amen. So it could be the triumphal entry, and it could be the return of Christ, but, but I think it refers to something in between. To the turning of, of many Jews to salvation. We'll, we'll see this in, in Acts chapter 2, where in the, the sermon that Peter preaches, about 4,000 Jews are going to repent and turn to Jesus. But I think it's even, even further fulfilled later in the, in the Gospels as before the time of Christ's return that referred to in, in Romans 11, 25 and following there, where Paul speaks of a partial hardening that has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then many Jews will come to saving faith. So here Jesus is saying that, that judgment is coming, but there's hope. There's hope. The the offer of of salvation still stands. It is not God's will to utterly forsake his people. He will save the elect of Israel. He'll save the elect of every tribe and tongue and nation. Nothing will thwart Jesus from his mission. And nothing will thwart God's plan. God's will will be done. God will save his people. So these Jews had an opportunity to repent and turn to Christ. You also have that opportunity even now. Judgment is coming for all who will not. If you are here as an unregenerate person, if you are here as someone whose will is still walking in rebellion against God, still walking according to your immoral will, by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, turn away from your sin. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Submit to his moral will. Submit to his decretive will. And trust in Jesus. God is calling you to submit to his moral will and his decretive will. Is your will submitted to God? This is something that that even we as believers have to continue to strive to do because because even though our will has been changed, our flesh is still strong. We, we still have an, an immoral will, according to our flesh, that, that competes with God's moral will, that we still chafe against God's decretive will when, when God does things that we don't like. Because we're forgetting that it is God who's on the throne, not us. We're, we're forgetting that it is God who is omniscient and not us. Are you able to pray? God, your will be done. No matter what you do, your will is good. God, will your, please, may your will be done. I often think of the prayer of of Betty Scott Stan, who was a, a missionary to China in the early 20th century. She prayed, Lord, I give up my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes and ambitions, and I accept thy will for my life. I give up myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee, to be thine forever. I hand over to thy keeping all of my friendships. All the people whom I love are to take second place in my heart. Fill me now and seal me with thy spirit. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost. For for me to live is Christ. Amen. Well, Betty Scott Stam and her husband were martyred in the Boxer Rebellion in China. Both of them killed because they had decided to follow Jesus. Friends, this sounds like a a superhuman prayer. And it is. It is beyond your ability, left to your own devices, it is beyond your ability to pray this prayer from the heart. It is beyond your ability in your flesh to submit to God in any form. So yes, this is a superhuman prayer. But it's just a Christian prayer. This is a prayer of of all people who have really turned from their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ. This needs to be your prayer. This needs to be my prayer. That we will submit to God for His glory, for the advance of His kingdom. And we will look back 
Maybe even not until the return of Christ. But we will look back and we will say thank you God and praise you God for your will was indeed good. Your will was indeed perfect. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we praise you for your perfect will. Help us, Lord, to have a biblical understanding of your will, of your moral will and your decretive will, and also of your characteristic. Then we will look to you with confidence. We will trust you no matter what comes to pass. They will be faithful to you no matter what temptation rises before us. Lord, for the glory of your name, may your saints in this church live in such a way of, of conscious submission and obedience to your will out of worship for you. Lord, we pray that you would work your will in the lives of any unbelievers who are hearing this as well. That you would grant repentance and faith. That you would grant new life. That you would grant joyful submission to you, holy God, in all things. For your glory and for the advance of your kingdom.